YouTube, what is up? We are back with another weekly Q&A. The legs are absolutely fucking destroyed. Um, we were supposed to do a lower body lift today, but from those lunges that we did on Tuesday, for the gram, for the YouTube, for you guys, uh, my legs are wrecked, so we're gonna do that lower body day tomorrow. We're gonna do league tonight, and we'll do a questionnaire today. So we're gonna get to all the questions that we had uh, on the Instagram. If you guys have any questions for next week's Q&A, you can leave them in the comment section here. Um, eventually, I wanna turn this over to all YouTube Q&As and just keep Instagram Q&As on Instagram and YouTube Q&As on here. So uh, build up the community a little bit that way. I have been really enjoying the more positive aspect of YouTube. I like it, so uh, I'm gonna continue to build a community here, and I think that's a cool piece. So, let's get to uh, the questions. Um, we're gonna be drinking a little Zevia here during it. Mm, little mountain Zevia this week. Um, zero calories, it tastes amazing. Um, not sponsored by them, but um, I just like showing some of the things that I, uh, that I drink and that I eat, and that is definitely a keeper in there. The only, the only bad thing with the Zevias, I don't know if I've talked about this on YouTube, but I didn't know they had um, caffeine in them. They have like 50 milligrams or something like that of caffeine, but I would do it as my little like sweet treat at night, like if I was hungry or something like that, and I would chug one of those before night. I'd be like, bro, what the fuck? Like, why can I not sleep? And then I was finding out that there's caffeine in there. So if you need to stay away from caffeine, maybe it's not the best one. That's why I like the sugar-free root beer is a little bit better because there's no caffeine, but these go down smooth and they feel great. And we're gonna be sipping on it during today's Q&A. Ah. All right, let's get to the first Q&A. Eric asked, favorite ways to train the neck? I think I've talked about this a couple times with the Olympic lifts, but adding in the Olympic lifts, adding in heavy pulls, adding in heavy deadlifts have been one of my favorite ways to train the neck. Even if it's just a hex bar deadlift, if you're anti Olympic lift, anti deadlift dude, even doing like a hex bar deadlift, I know the coaches that like have sworn off deadlifts will still do hex bar deadlifts. It's kind of weird. Like we won't get into that argument, but building up those traps, absolute money maker for building up the neck. You get a good, huge neck, good, huge traps there. Your neck's going to grow with it. Um, I had whiplash from softball, from the, the, the rapid rotations, um, and I realized I had taken a ton of that neck volume out, a ton of that shrug volume out, a ton of that trap workout, and just adding in some of the Olympic lifts where we're actively pulling up there, and then adding in heavy hex bar and uh, regular deadlifts, my traps grew and almost doubled in size. Like, it was crazy how fast it happened. Makes you look like a super athlete when you have good traps and good shoulders there. And um, I think Olympic lifts is a super easy way to kind of do that, or deadlifts is a super easy way to do it. Uh, that is going to be your biggest bang for your buck because obviously you're working on a ton of, ton of other aspects while you're working on it. Specifically for the neck, though, for certain exercises, you can do like a four-way neck ISO. So you can lean against the wall, put a little pad against the wall. My body's at a 45-degree angle. I'm going to hit this 45-degree angle here sideways. I'm going to do forward. I'm going to go other side, and I'm going to do backwards. Start at like 30 seconds each way, a couple sets of 30 seconds, build all the way up. We've built up to five minutes in each position there. Absolutely spicy on the neck. It feels like if you're having neck pain, um, I guess I shouldn't say pain like an injury, but if you're just like a tight neck, it's a great stretch while you are strengthening it. It's a money maker there. I really like that for my athletes. Um, and you can progress and regress that one as you see fit. So one of the things we do as an athlete gets stronger, you can do a partner resisted. So we'll do the same thing, these four way, we have a partner push on the neck through that range of motion all the way here. Coming back, you'll do the same thing forward back. Um, sometimes easier if they're laying on a bench with that so you can push their neck side to side. Obviously, you have to have a good relationship with your partner so they're not just snapping your neck there, but that's a really good one. One that you can do is just parts of the spinal flow when you're seated, um, if you are having neck pain, um, and you can just do side to sides, ups, downs. We went side to side. Do we do side to sides, up, down, and then ear to ear, you can add in those. Um, we'll hit like 100 reps of those. A lot of times we'll just have that in our warm up. We'll do like 50 reps each year, 50 reps each year, 50 reps each going side to side. And that's a money maker for the neck. So those are kind of the things that I do for the neck. Those isos, a lot of trap work, I even just heavy shrugs with dumbbells. Um, and then we're adding in some of those isometric type movements. And then even things like a neck bridge, like something basic as a neck bridge, absolute money maker. And most coaches, or not most coaches, most athletes' necks are just unable to go into a bridge, which is wild because uh, any wrestler knows just like how quickly you can build that up. And just like, you can tell when an athlete has a wrestling background and not. And um, you start adding in neck bridges, neck walk rounds in some of the gymnastic type movements or some of the wrestling type movements. And those, uh, those necks grow and get strong really quickly. And it's just because they're not touched on a ton. So you do the general stuff with the Olympic lifts, the trap work, and the, the, the pulling volume, and then some of the specific exercises. But 
you don't have to spend a ton of your program time on network. Like those two things alone is going to get most, I would say 99.999% of athletes a strong, huge neck uh, that doesn't give them pain. Brotherton Kirk asks, talk shoes. What shoes do you like to lift in, sprint in, jump in? Um, and I'm, I'm going to be completely honest here. Every single shoe, every single athletic shoe I have owned in the past since college, so past seven years, maybe even longer, has been from the lost and found. And I'm not joking. Um, either, like, and most of them are brand new pairs of shoes in the lost and found. I, I went to a very um, prestigious, rich college where dudes would just throw out fucking random stuff and coming from my trailer home, I'd be like, dude, I'm fucking taking that. Um, so the week before they would take them, or the day before they would take them to like Goodwill. So like if the lost and found, they've been there in the lost and found for a long enough time, they just take them to Goodwill or they sell them off. Um, I would go into there the day before, right when they're about to get rid of them and look for size 13 shoes and I'm gonna grab them. Um, and I've gotten a lot of nice pairs of shoes. I think I have like, um, let's get a pair over here. Like, I don't even know what the fuck these are, but like, dude, like brand new athletic shoes. I've worn these a couple times, but like super nice shoes. I get those in the lost and found. I don't focus too much on them. I lift a lot in Crocs. I lift a lot in sandals. I lift a lot barefoot. Um, for me, it doesn't personally matter. I think if you're focused a little bit too much on that stuff, you kind of get in your head and you're focused on the new. It's like the dude with the shitty swing that always buys the new softball back because it's going to fix his swing. It's like, eh, no, it's not. Uh, I will say I have lifted in Olympic shoes, Olympic lifting shoes when I was with Kyle. Those feel amazing. I like those. Um, so if you're doing Olympic lifts or squatting a lot, those are nice. But the tough thing with those is you can't like go and sprint with them. You got to switch it over. I'm a little bit lazy there. So I kind of like going from my lifts into my sprints um, back and forth or lifts into jumps. And so that's typically why I don't wear them all the time um, or use them all the time. But yeah, most of my pairs of shoes that came from the lost and found, uh, and then I'll wear sandals or whatever I'm wearing that day and just walk into the gym and just kind of rip it from there. I think if, uh, if the shoe is what's holding you back, um, there's probably bigger issues there. I obviously get there. There's nuance there. If you're very specific or you have a foot or ankle issue, um, or you're a power lifter or an Olympic lifter and you're getting into specific lifts, there's a bigger issue there. And I'm not saying don't focus on your shoe. I'm not saying you don't, if you like shoes, you can go focus on it. But I think a lot of athletes that are overly focused on small things like shoes need not be. They have a lot of other things in their program and their diet and their sleep that they can work on and fix before they focus on their shoe. My Russian counterpart asked, how to be less, how to be less neurotic and more based. Uh, I answered this on a Q and a right before we went to the conference and I told him show up to the conference and, uh, that'll be the way to be less neurotic because everything that I preach is not being neurotic and more based. Um, but yeah, proving it to yourself. I, th I think there's a big component to proving to your own body that you are capable of movements. And that's why I love, love, love gymnastics, love rolly rolls. There's a lot of benefits to like bending the spine and moving the spine in these ways and interacting with the ground. But the number one reason that I use rolly rolls is to prove to an athlete that they are capable of doing things that they weren't capable of doing before. Um, and a lot of athletes are scared of the ground. They're scared of going inverted. And if you can get them to do these things, they're like, oh my God, my body's capable of doing this and I didn't get hurt. What else can I do? Um, prove to them that they're strong with the barbell. You can definitely do that with the barbell. You can gain confidence in basic movements with the barbell, squatting, benching, doing pull-ups is a huge one for athletes getting an athlete to do their first pull-up, they suddenly are like, oh my God, my body is capable. And when you get them in the thought process of their body is capable, they're no longer in the thought process of, am I going to get hurt, right? So I think just proving to your athletes over and over again that they are not going to get hurt um, because we have scaled and progressed and regressed to the way that they need to be and that their bodies are fully capable of doing the things that they want to do. And then also having a realistic conversation on the back end of sports and the dangers of sports and that if you do get hurt, it's not because anything's broken in you. If you are in pain, it's not because your body's broken and you're never going to recover and anything like that. It's just the stimulus of the sport, the stimulus of your life was too high for your body to handle. And now we just need to raise the stimulus of your, or what your body's capable of doing to match that, right? So I think just giving your athletes hope and giving them data points to back up that hope. It's not just this bullshit rah-rah conversation of, yeah, you're, you're okay. Everything's great. Follow my go-to system. It's like, no, I'm going to prove to you over and over again that you are capable of these things through progress and regress type movements. And then you will be able to walk out of the weight room feeling capable, feeling strong, feeling able. And once you have an athlete like that, dude, sky's the limit for them. Daniel Benedict asks, what's the purpose of those two to three minute lower eccentrics, right? So I told him, and I, I've said this a lot of times on YouTube, 
go buy Dak's stuff. Dak is massively in this rabbit hole. He loves and geeks out over this stuff. He's talking about uh, antagonist muscles and uh, pulling into positions. And we focus on some of that stuff for sure. But when he's doing a push-up ISO, he's thinking about pulling with his bicep into that ISO and super specific, minute details. And if you're interested in all of that stuff, you should follow Dak. Why do we do quasis? Uh, and quasis, we call them quasi isometrics. Um, I first learned of them five or six years ago from a powerlifting guy, a super old powerlifting guy. I don't even know his name anymore, but he's on Dave Tate's podcast. I think it's like the second or third podcast on Dave Tate's podcast. And he's, he's the bodybuilder that is, or powerlifter that is super beat up right now. An older guy, he's a legend in the powerlift or bodybuilding world or powerlifting world. Um, but you can go back and listen to that, Dave Tate. You'll recognize it right away. Um, but he talks about how his body's so beat up that the only way for him to get his pump right now and his uh, is like strength stimulus in and the stimulus for his workouts is super low or super slow movement. So he was talking about taking a barbell and he would just lower it with no weight on for five minutes and just feel the bicep lengthen the entire time. And I thought that was super cool. It was just a new way to look at movement. I'd never heard of it that way. Um, I'd never heard of that using that stimulus before. So I was like, okay, let's experiment with some of this stuff. And right away, what the athletes geeked out on was it was something hard for them to do. Um, I do believe, I know Will Rattel talks about this, but I do believe certain parts of your workout should be hard, like for the athlete to leave and feel like they have done something right. And I think you can get this hardness done without being a total idiot. Like you don't have to go run gassers. I'm not, whatever. Like you don't have to go run a gassers. You don't have to do stupid shit for them to feel like they got a lot of work done, right? You can do more productive things that are hard so they can leave the workout feeling like, holy fuck, I just did that. Again, that's another data point to prove to themselves I can do hard things. My body is capable of doing hard things. My body is capable of doing insane things. They give, build that confidence within themselves. But slow lowers are a really, really good way to do that. You have them slow lower into a push up or slow lower into a squat and they leave that like, holy fuck, dude, I just got absolutely wrecked. That was amazing. I got a pump. And they get that meathead side of things. And I, I, I used to be super against that. I tried to like outsmart everything. Like, oh, it's not about being hard. It's not about being sore. But it's like, dude, the athletes fucking like that. And it gets them to show up. And there's some weird demonic thing in a lot of our brains that like the aspect of feeling like we got a lot of work in. And slow lowers can be a very productive way of getting that hard work done, right? On that note, why, why is it productive in the first place? Why, like, why are you not just doing other things? Why is it more like productive than a gasser? I use it a lot for smaller muscles and working on building the armor, right? Um, I think it's an amazing tool to feel certain positions, um, a deep range of motion, like push up or a deep squat or a deep lunge and feeling certain things within that movement as you're lowering into these movements. So the push up, can you feel the stretch in your chest? Can you feel your tricep? Can you feel your bicep when you're doing these things, when you're pulling into these movements, right? And I think that's a really, really important thing for a lot of athletes, especially athletes that are very inhibited with movement. They're very stiff. They're very locked up. They're not feeling a lot of these things. Um, I also think it can be used as a weighted stretch. Um, and I use it a lot in that kind of setting. So if I want more range of motion in the shoulders, I want more range of motion in the hips, I want more of a range of motion in their squat, I will have them go into these extreme range of motions in a very slow lower to own that movement and open up that movement. And I think something like the dip ISO is another really beautiful one where they're slow lowering into that and really opening up that chest. A lot of athletes, I mean, myself included, have these rounded shoulders, super tight pecs, and they're not able to get out of that position. And I think more time under tension in that weighted stretch to open that up and open up some more range of motion. And again, it's just a, it's just a stretch. A lot of the ISOs that I use I look at them honestly as mobility work, but if you say a stretch versus an ISO, an ISO gives them, I did a lot of fucking hard work today, a stretch they kind of half-ass and they kind of like go, oh, okay, this is supposed to feel good, right? So I think using the slow lowers uh, as a stretch, as a range of motion builder is absolute money and it's something that we've done over and over again and we've seen big range of motion changes and mostly big changes in how that athlete feels in, in some of these um deep positions and especially for some of these smaller muscles too like one of the things the power lifter was talking about was like a one pound lateral raise nice and slow lower and then nice and or nice and slow raise and nice and slow lower into some of these positions and you'll feel parts of your shoulder that you've never felt before and I think that's a cool piece to the puzzle there for a lot of athletes that haven't felt some of these positions before.
And then on a smaller aspect of it, I think it can be used as some pre-fatigued. I've talked about using the pre-fatigue or post-fatigue method. So if you are feeling those muscles, you're trying to feel that muscle. So let's say I'm trying to feel my chest when I'm bench pressing. A lot of times I'll have them do a deep range of motion push-up to get that chest firing before they go and bench. And then now they got that chest firing. It feels like it's opened up. They've gained a new range of motion and now we're bench pressing where we feel that chest. I um, mean, you can do that with any muscle that they're, they, they feel like they can't feel. If you have an injured athlete that needs to get those quads going, um, you can have them do like a slow lower squat before their actual squats and their quads can fire up in that pre-fatigue. You get a great hypertrophy stimulus there. Going before they go and squat, before they do their main lifts. I also really like it for a, um, before we sprint. Um, we've set a lot of PRs doing like a slow lower ISO where they're pulling into that position, they're feeling that hip flexor, they're getting into that lengthened position, um, and it's almost biasing that lengthened position before they go in sprints and they can get into that position much better. So that is kind of why I use slow lowers. Again, I know DAC uses them, I know the um, DB Hammer kind of system uses them in a more specific way where they're trying to actively feel the opposite muscle when they're pulling into these positions. Um, and, and we focus on some of those pieces, but honestly, I look at it more as a stretch and more as getting something hard done and building up some of these smaller muscles um, and smaller feelings and deeper ranges of motion uh, with some of the positions that we're finding in these uh, slow eccentrics. Cassie Hackett asked, do you try to progressively overload new slash different movements, patterns slash drills? Yes, we progressively and regressively overload and underload everything that we're doing, right? Um, I, I showed the example of a handstand push-up. Uh, if, we're, if we're doing handstands or handstand push-ups on a day, we have some athletes that can do a standing free range of motion handstand push-up. They can no wall, they get into a handstand, and they can do a push-up and wrap them off the ground, like the highest level of athletes there, right? Um, and then you have athletes that cannot, like, they couldn't do a regular push-up, right? And we're trying to get them to do a handstand push-up, right? So huge degrees of um, abilities there, right? Huge degree of capabilities for movement, right? So for an athlete that can't do a push-up, maybe for their handstand push-up, we are literally just doing push-ups and we're building up some strength there. And then we're gonna build them up into an incline push-up, right? So that they're getting a little bit more on those hands, a little bit more incline. Then we can go a higher box and then we can go against the wall and we can hold a handstand ISO, right? And then maybe we can do a partner assisted. That's one that we use a lot of times that not a lot of coaches, I feel like they don't think about. Like you just have a partner there, man. Like, so they're going against the wall, they have the wall to support. And you just have a partner grabbing their feet, pulling them back up. And then as you have athletes progress, you have athletes that are able to do things, they can go a single arm, right? And more maybe a single arm partner assisted. Those are freaking spicy. You want a really spicy one? Single arm against the wall or single arm freestanding. You have a partner lower you in and then helping you back up. Really spicy. Sometimes that one takes two partners to use, but that one's absolutely gas. Um, but really with all of this stuff, you're trying to find where the athlete's current edge is, where do they want to go, how can we give them something new that is a stimulus, something that is past where they are currently at to level up the body. For some athletes, that's that single arm handstand push-up, and for some athletes, it's an incline push-up. But you just find that based off the athlete. It's not necessarily the exercise in and of itself. It's the stimulus that you're trying to get done that day, a handstand push-up, a vertical pressing motion that you want to build up. You want to get Maybe you want to build up the hands that day. You want to get some, you want to get them on their hands. So maybe it's just a crawl, right? So keep, start with the stimulus. What is the stimulus, stimulus that you want to get done that day? And progress and regress your exercises or your drills to get that stimulus done for that athlete. For some athletes, you really have to progress. For some athletes, you really have to regress. And you want to find that middle ground for a lot of athletes. Todd Davidson asked, does load management matter when it's play or does auto regulation or does it auto regulate when it's no longer fun? Yeah, that's why I, I, I think it auto-regulates when it's no longer fun. Um, and for the reason of it's no longer fun when you're no longer PRing and you're no longer winning, right? And you're no longer PRing when you're no longer winning when you no longer have output abilities, right? So when you're gassed, right? So it's kind of that perfect auto-regulatory system, right? If you're PRing, it's gonna be super fun. You're gonna to wanna to keep doing it. You're gonna have high levels of interest. And when you're PRing, that means you're firing and you have more left in the tank. And when you're not PRing and when you start to take that step back and when you start to lose games and you start to lose a step, you lose interest in it real quick because it feels like you're running your head against the wall and then it's time to go to the next thing, right? And some days you overshoot, some days you undershoot, right? So some days it's going to be like, maybe if you had done three more jumps that day, you would have PR'd and you just had the shitty start today. I've definitely had sessions like that where it's like, it's just a shitty start today. I was like, fuck, dude, I just lost interest in this. Definitely could have pushed more, got more volume. And then there's going to be days where you're 
continually PRing and maybe you jumped 60 times in a session and maybe you overshot a little bit. But overall, if you do it in this interest, disinterest way and you, you stop when you're disinterested, it kind of levels itself out on the days that you're doing a lot of work. There'll be days where you're doing not a lot of work. There's days where you find that Goldilocks middle zone and it's beautiful, um, but it kind of averages out and has a beautiful middle ground right there. So we just had like, I think it's our seventh or eighth athlete jump 40 inches on a jump mat. And all of our jumps are, we don't periodize our jumps. We don't have a certain volume on our jumps. Every single one of our jumps is until disinterested, right? And we've had eight athletes in our gym jump over 40 inches like so many dudes are just PRing like crazy and I really believe in this approach and I think it's a much better way to auto regulate based off that day um, and it gets athletes a high level of stimulus done that I think sometimes we are a little bit too helicopter parenty with our programs where we say five sets of three jumps today it's like well like two jumps in, I realized five sets of three is going to be too much for them. Or they get to five sets of three and they're continually PRing and we're going to cut them off. Like it's kind of a silly way to do it. So we've had great success in the play-based model, interest, disinterest model, uh, PR wise, stimulus wise. And I think it's because that auto-regulatory system comes together. Auto-regulatory system, that's such like a bro science thing to say. I don't really know what I'm saying there, but it kind of matches up perfectly, right? It does auto-regulate. Disinterest and how much juice you got left in the system kind of go hand in hand. T Mozzie asked thoughts on ETS performance. <laughs> I'm not going to comment on other training systems that are in the, in the system. I interned there. Obviously I don't work there anymore. Um, and I have made a lot of changes. JST is a great training system. And that's all I have to say. JST is elite. If you want a good training system and you are in the area, I would go to JST over anywhere, not just ETS. Mar Muscle asks how to lose muscle mass in the same way or the exact opposite way that you gain it, right? So if you want to lose muscle mass, I don't really know why you would want to lose muscle mass. So you probably want to lose weight um, unless you're trying to get away from that. Like if you're in the thought process of a bulky look, but even then, like you still probably want to lose weight and body fat, not necessarily muscle mass. I don't really know many athletes and people that really want to lose a ton of muscle mass, right? But if you do want to lose muscle mass, you probably want to stop lifting, go for long walks, uh, start doing a lot of cardio. Not in the sense that cardio is going to kill the muscle gains. It's just spend more time in the things that skinny people do, which is long distance running, uh, walking. Uh, Mark Dettel is a great example of this. Dude was like 185, 190 pounds outside linebacker, pretty jack dude. Um, he was never the biggest guy, but pretty bit jack dude. Started long distance running and he's probably 160 pounds right now. Uh, super skinny, super frail, um, but it works for his sport, right? So the body kind of adapts to the stimulus that you put it through, right? So when you're running long distance, your body's like, dude, I, there's no reason for me to keep all this extra body weight on. There's no reason for me to keep all this extra body weight or body, uh, all this muscle mass on. Sorry, I, muscle mass is a weird word for me because I'm not used to people wanting to lose muscle mass. But when you go for long runs, it's telling you, okay, to solve the movement problem of this long run of this 50 miles that I'm going to run this weekend, right? It is not optimal for me to have all this muscle mass, so I'm going to start to lose it, right? And obviously, part of that is just calories in versus calories out. When you're running a shitload, um, you're not eating during that time you're running. I think that's a big part of why a lot of long-distance runners are skinniest, because those runs take, like, seven fucking hours, and that's seven hours you can't snack. Whereas the power lifters, dude, you can lift for, like, an hour and then go eat for the rest of the day. So I think that's a piece of it. But the calories in, calories out, you're consuming way less calories than you're intaking, you're going to lose body fat. Um, you're going to lose body weights and probably some of that's going to be muscle mass. But if you do want to lose muscle mass, start doing things that skinny people do and not things that big, strong people do. Hit Heart HB asks, what's the deadlift at? Um, I deadlifted last week, uh, hit 505 for a single. That was pretty hard. And that's typically where I sit around for a typical deadlift. I'm pretty trash at deadlifting, not going to lie. Like I'm not very good at it. My starting position off the ground is ass. Every time I deadlift, I feel like kind of dick for a long period of time after. Um, and I kind of avoid it. But I kind of avoid it mostly just because I'm a pussy. And I don't like doing things I'm just absolutely god terrible at. And everybody knows. Like, the deadlift is a lift where everybody knows, oh, like, you know what you're doing there. Like, uh, if I deadlift 500 pounds, people know what that means because everybody has deadlifted that, right? And um, you can go to a gym and you can see 16-year-olds deadlifting five plates, right? Like, it's it's people long arms can deadlift. I'm not saying that's why I suck, but if you have really long arms, you can deadlift a shitload of weight and you have 16 year olds deadlifting 500 pounds. And I don't like looking like a little beta bitch to the 160 pound 
kid with super long arms that picks it up. Um, doesn't mean I don't do it. I, I, I still do it, but um, that's why I don't deadlift a ton or don't post my deadlift a ton is because I'm absolute dog water at it. It would be cool to get up to a 600 pound deadlift, but I was doing deadlifts every single day for, I think I did it for three months straight. And actually it helped my deadlift a lot. I just got so burnt out by it because I was just continually terrible at it. Um, even like my, my, my benefit, like deadlifting 505 the other day is because of those three months of deadlifting and, and really focusing on it before I dude, it was terrible. There would be days where it was like 405 would felt like so fucking heavy off the ground. Um, and I don't think I, when I hurt him at a disc, herniated my disc, I think there's, I have a lot of issues with like bracing off of the ground and keeping that brace. And if I lose that brace at all, dude, it's just, it feels like I have no power at all to pull or push with my legs. And it just turns into a total crapshoot. And uh, I think part of that's my technique. I think part of that's my arm length and just the, how my body's built for the deadlift, which is just, it's just not, it's not a pretty lift for me. Right. Um, but I, my goal is to get up to a 600 pound deadlift eventually. Maybe when I get disinterested with, um, with softball, um, doing both at the same time is tough for me having a heavy uh, volume swing day and squatting and deadlifting or Olympic lifting after a heavy swing day which is most days are heavy swings day um, the back gets pretty fatigued on those days and it's like those lifts just get bodied and trash so deadlifts at 505 not great I don't know why I've made that such a rant long rant but yeah Salvador asked dynamic training question mark that's not a question. I don't know what dynamic training, do it. Yeah, good, elite, like you should do dynamic things in your training, um, unless there is a training system called dynamic training that I don't know about. And if there is, roast me in the comment section. Salvador asked, also asked, lifting heavy Olympics, change of direction, and sprinting will be enough for teen to fly. Yes, yeah, dude, if you're lifting heavy, you're doing Olympics, Olympic lifting, your change of direction, and your sprinting, you kind of got it all. I maybe do some mobility work there. Maybe do some, I mean, the change of direction is going to be some movement-based stuff there. But yeah, absolutely, dude. Like, don't overcomplicate that. If you're a high schooler looking to fly, sprint really, really fast, jump really, really high, lift heavy weights, uh, and recover, and then do it over and over again, right? However you want to get that done. But yeah, absolutely, especially as a teenager, don't overcomplicate that. Just go get after those weights and get after your training sessions. The Forger Richmond asked, do you ever push sleds or prowlers? I've seen sprinting with sleds. Um, I don't, but that's just because it doesn't, like my gyms, we, we put prowlers on our gym turf and it, it slides like absolute shit. I got to get chains for my gym or like a 1080. 1080s would be the ultimate goal. But resisted sprints, absolute money maker, dude. I, I think it would be like, it's, it's one of the best strength training exercises you can do. Um, I think it's one of the best ways to work acceleration and force through the ground. And I love them. I, I really do. I'm a big fan and proponent of heavy sprinting. Um, or even, it doesn't even have to be heavy, but just weighted sprints. I think it's an absolute money maker. I think it's one of the best ways to get big guys to run and be interested in sprinting because it's something they're good at. I like chain sprints better than uh, sled pushes. I think sometimes sled pushes they just end up looking a little goofy. It's kind of this weird, awkward angle that you're driving from. Not to say that they're always negative, but if I had an option, I'm going to pick chain sprints over sled sprints or sled pushes. Um, dragging the sled is obviously different than pushing the sled, but I think the arm action is really important in the sprints as well, and I think when you take that away. Um, but obviously some coaches use it to take it away. Like they're, they're just focusing on the leg drive aspect. I know DeFranco used to really do like heavy ass sled marches. Um, and that'd be like a main strength training exercise for him. And he would do it. The goal is no longer sprinting, but it's a strength stimulus. So how you're looking at that matters, right? If you're, if you're using a heavy ass sled drag or heavy ass sled push as a sprinting drill, it's probably not as effective. But if you're using it as a strength stimulus, it is. And the strength stimulus can then be applied to sprinting. Like you need to be strong to accelerate fast, right? So I love them. I just don't post them because our prowlers don't work on our uh, turf. Our turf is kind of butt cheeks for that. Tommy Train asked, important to consider planes of motion in programming heavier lifts, i.g. Uh, heavy frontal plane. <coughs> yes, I think this is an underutilized thing in strength conditioning is heavy loading of like a Cossack squat, heavy loading of a lateral step up, right? Heavy loading of some of these different movements and I think sometimes they get too different and that's why they, they, they can't think they can heavy load it. But like we do like three or at max heavy Zurcher Cossack squats, dude. And they're, they're absolute money, right? That can be your unilateral lift for the day. Or we've done like we are holding onto a rack and you've got a single leg lateral step up holding onto a barbell like a pickup a deadlift um, but I think you can strengthen and work a lot of different muscles that you're not used to working 
when you're doing these things. And I think a lot of times when you put it out, the accessory work, it's not like a Cossack and the accessories versus a Cossack and the main lift. Athletes approach that differently, right? And I think if you really want the high level of stimulus, you either have to, you got to have them loaded heavy at some time, right? And I, and I think you can absolutely do that as your main list. And one of the things I use it for too is if an athlete's super beat up, instead of having them do a Bulgarian or having, instead of them have do like a back squat where they know their max, they have, they have that pressure of, I'm really beat up, but I know like we have a three rep max today. My three rep max is 315 pounds. I got to get close to that today, but I'm feeling like shit. Instead of doing that and like putting that pressure on them um, to run their head through the wall on a day when they're beat up, I will have them do a weird lift in quotations as their main lift. So uh, I will have them do a heavy Cossack as their main lift that day because they have no idea what the fuck their three rep max heavy Cossack is. Um, and they're working a little bit different muscles, but it's also a way to almost underload, let's say the spine of the spine is beat up that day or just the quads are beat up that day, right? So um, I think it's a cool way to get a high level of stimulus done without crushing the system, right? I think Will talks about finding ways to stimulate the system after you reach a certain level. So I, Will's talks about this obviously because he deadlifts like 800 pounds, right? Him trying to run his face through the wall to like hit a one rep max deadlift is fucking brutal dude like an 800 pound deadlift is going to tax the system crazy but if he can find ways and he does it in the amrap way where he's trying to hit as many reps as possible in a certain period of time to find a way to work, stimulate the body in a different way that doesn't crush it as much but you still get a brand new novel stimulus into the body without running your head into the wall stimulating the same way over and over again it doesn't always have to be more weight specifically right it can be done in a, a different movement, but it's still a heavy strength stimulus. So that's how I would use it, and that's kind of how we play with those things. How do you squat and good morning AMRAPs without safety bars and without zerters? Thanks. Oh, I roasted this dude on Instagram. Dude, use a barbell. You don't need a safety squat bar to hit AMRAPs. That's unbelievably silly. Like, barbell, dumbbell, fucking grab a rock. Like, what are we talking about there, man? Um... And I, you're young. I think I think this person's a young high school athlete, so he's probably seen it always done on a safety squat bar. So I don't want to like roast you specifically, but it's like, dude, you're overthinking it, man. You don't need any special equipment. You can get really fucking strong, and the people that are asking these questions can get really strong smelling weights, right? Like you're just not at that level yet, right? You don't need a safety squat bar. We hardly ever use our safety squat bars at the gym just because barbells are on all the time, and that's what athletes lift, right? Um, but you can grab a sandbag. You can grab a rock. You can use a barbell, right? Hit an AMRAP for your squats. Do it again. You don't need a safety squat bar. B. Smithy asks, easy ways to incorporate games into pitching, baseball in general, training. Um, you can go general or you can go super specific, right? So I'll start with the general. We'll go all the way to specific. General, you as a baseball player solve movement problems by throwing. You are a general thrower of a ball, right? You want to get really good at becoming a general thrower of a ball. Play games that allow you to solve the movement problem by throwing a ball, right? So handball is a beautiful example. I've had so many pitchers and QBs come up to me and tell me, dude, the number one thing that you did for me in our training, and we had, dude, I had all these fucking rebound stuff, all these ISOs that we were doing, all these heavy lifts. I thought it was a fucking man and a genius for everything we do. You know what they tell me? It's, dude, it's handball. I love the handball game that we're playing. It's like, I feel like an athlete again throwing. I'm throwing from all these different slots. I feel unrestricted when I'm throwing. You get out of your head. I think baseball is one of the most domed up sports of all time, right? Maybe track throwers are the only other sport that's that domed up. But it's like such a, you, you have so many cues that are thrown in your head. You have to hit a certain spot. You have so much pressure for one throw. Like so many athletes just restrict themselves so much. And just putting them into general games where they're throwing the ball again athletically, absolute moneymaker, right? So start super general, start with some of those games where we're, we're playing handball, right? Then you can get a little bit more specific, right? So maybe it's having a pitcher play shortstop, right? Or not even play shortstop in a game, but just in practice, right? Have the pitcher just... So now you have the baseball, so it's a little bit more specific. You're feeling the ball, it's a little bit more specific. When instead of hitting a certain spot off the mound, let's just be an athletic thrower, right? So I'm going to hit you balls, and you're going to athletically throw the ball to first, right? You can also do throw variations there. That's another really good one, too. So it's like I would have our quarterbacks like play catch, but for 50 throws in a row, everyone has to be thrown differently, right? So you're throwing off so many different angles. That can be a great warm-up for athletes to get out of their heads and get to become an athletic throw over the ball again. But again, it's more specific, right? It's not this general handball game, but now we're working a little bit more specific with the certain implement that we have. Then you can take it to small-sided games in baseball, right? So Put yourself in situations that you struggle in, right? So maybe it's you suck at facing lefties, right? Or you suck at facing righties. 
face those in your sport, right? Put yourself in situations where you're doing that. Maybe you suck when it's a 3-0 count. So maybe in practice, we're starting every pitcher or every batter off at a 3-0 count, and you have to battle through that. So that's a little mini game within and of itself. It's not the true game. You're still pitching, but it's very specific. But now you have a little bit of technical and tactical constraints of we're starting this pitch with a 3-0 count, and you got to go win. And uh, you're playing that game within the game there. On the, on the baseball field and getting over that fear of walking an athlete or, or whatever it is, walking a batter, whatever that is. But I think there's a lot of ways to create these little mini games within the game itself to work on where you're specifically weak. But again, start general, funnel here. Don't just pick one or the other, right? So funnel all the way here and then funnel all the way back and kind of ebb and flow there. Shit, for a whole baseball practice, you could warm them up with uh, handball. You just do a warm-up handball, and then you could have them do the creative throws, and then you can have them do specific situations, and you could do some sort of variation of that every day to where you're working all the way from being a general thrower of the ball to a specific thrower of the ball, right? A specific baseball pitcher. And I, I think that's a really cool way to get your athletes not gnomed up and become athletic throwers of a ball, which is why they played the sport in the first place. Eric Guthrie asked, top softball swing tips to hit nukes. Uh, if you want to hit nukes, hit the bottom half of the ball. Um, baseball swing, like matching it is a little bit better for straight up nukes because you want that launch angle. So the baseball swing is a little bit better. I cut the ball, so my line drive, my home runs are typically, not all the time, typically a little bit more on the line. Uh, ideally they are because then if it's, a, if it's a miss, it's going to be that line drive swing. Um, but I still have, when you cut the ball, you get that backspin and it goes forever. But So when you're cutting it, you would cut the bottom half of the ball, so the ball's coming in, you cut the bottom half of the ball, it creates that backspin, and it gets that launch angle. Um, typically swinging at a little bit of a, not a super high pitch, but a little bit of a higher pitch, so you can take it and match that angle and go with it, um, and that ball's gonna fly, man. We've hit some absolute tanks that way. NG Powerlifting, any advice on incorporating unstructured training games such comps during private sessions? Incorporate them. Um, I think if your athletes don't believe in them yet, I think start to do it slowly. So instead of going full game-based model to start, just because you're trying, they're, you're, they're used to a traditional warm-up, start with mirror-based stuff. Like, okay, do a traditional warm-up, and then we're going to mirror each other in these, like maybe it's a three-cone drill. That could be a beautiful way to do it. They're used to doing pro agilities, right? So instead of just doing a pro agility and you want to get them into that play-based model, competition-based model, um, but they're not ready for the full play-based model, Put them in a three-cone agility drill, have them face each other. Instead of just running the pro agility, they have to mirror each other, right? So they're going left, right, left, right. On one goal call, one partner starts, and they have to mirror. And then on a second goal call, they have to sprint through one of the cones, right? So that'd be a beautiful way of treating it like a pro agility to where they're going left, right, they're mirroring each other. And the second goal call, you get that reactive sprint out of there. That'd be a beautiful way to do it. And then as you progress, just continually add in it, make it a little bit more game-based. Maybe add a opponent in there in the middle that um, is a little bit of a mirror or is giving you signs to point. So you're mirroring, but uh, a partner at any time in the middle can give you a point to the side. And when they point to that side, you've got to go touch that cone, right? So now you're not just mirroring one person, but the person that is being, that is the mouse that is being mirrored, they also have to react to the person pointing. And then for the most part though, just put a ball in the athlete's hand and let them be athletes um, and come up with games there, right? Um, and again, that's where you can go as general or specific as you want. I typically stay on the general free play side of things, and I have a lot of reasons for doing that. Um, but you can also go super specific if you're working with a super specific population. Um, football guys, you can get very specific. Uh, all, all, any team sport, you can go very specific with their implement and in situations that they see in the game, or you can go as general as possible. But yeah, dude, just create fields of play, create movement problems for them to solve, and they're going to go solve them. Uh, if you want a agility-based stimulus, game-based wise, create a shorter distance field, longer field, and they're gonna have to solve that movement problem with agility-based. If you want more speed-based reactive problems, create a longer field, narrower field, so the way to solve, to, the way to win the movement problem is uh, long sprints. Sorry I'm fatiguing with my words, I'm 40 minutes into this, um, but we got one question left, so I'm stuttering or all over the place, kind of ripping a little bit too hard today. Um, I think this is the last one. Connor Cole asks, sport, athlete, skill, adaptability over any skill strength in the gym. Oh, is sport, athlete, skill, adaptability more important than any skill in the gym or harder than any skill strength in the gym? Yes, well, it depends what your goal is. If you're an athlete, obviously, like, 
me learning the skill of swinging a bat is way more important than me learning the skill of picking up a barbell in the moment, right? Like I gotta go learn the skill of my sport. But it's not one or the other, right? I, you, at certain points, you're gonna ha you're gonna you're gonna need both. You need sports performance and you need skill acquisition and you need the sport, right? Sports performance is for the sport, but at certain points, the sport is gonna need sports performance, right? So, I talked about this in a rant. I think two uh, two YouTube episodes ago, where it's like. If you're feeling beat up all the time on the field, you're not feeling strong, you're feeling weak on the field, um, if you're hitting balls perfectly, you have a really good swing, but it's like an 80 exit below, then you need to go more to sports performance. You need to work on this force aspect. You need to develop your body a little bit more. You need to get a body that is able to feel better and do what you want it to do. If you're really strong in the weight room and it's super strong and you have a lot of good technical skills in the weight room, but you're not winning on the field, then you need to go spend a little bit more time on these things, right? Um, so I think it's an ebb and flow. I think these things work together um, and they can be very cohesive if you make them. I have a issue, and this is why I bring up a lot of the field-based stuff, is so many coaches only focus here and just I, I just think we sell a lot of things that just don't make sense here. We talk about all the importance of all the sports performance without ever talking about how does that transition to the field or when would that transition to field or talk about the time that this takes up that could have been spent here. I think we're really looking at developing the athlete and doing what we want to do with the athlete, which is win or become a better athlete in general on the field. You have to look at what do they need individually, right? For some athletes, it is literally just bigger, faster, stronger. They are 160 pounds soaking wet. A lot of baseball guys are like this. Like my program is way more meat heady for those guys because they have beautiful swings. Their sport is a sport that has a tradition of being very technical and working on the super specific things. And they need, like they have a, I've seen so many 16 year olds that just have beautiful, beautiful swings and they hit the ball 70 miles an hour. Dude, you just need to go eat some fucking food and get stronger so that beautiful swing can can do something like you can do something with that beautiful swing um, but then you have the football culture the the American football culture where it's all bigger faster stronger very little technical and tactical development especially when you get to the offense and defensive line um, some of the wide receivers are a little bit better with it but most of their technical tactical skill development is like weird footwork stuff and it's more honestly physiological than the technical tactical aspect right so I think it depends on the culture of your sport and what do you need individually and I think it's super easy to kind of tell what do you need individually if you're really good here and you suck here spend more time here if you're really good here and you suck here and you're feeling beat up here then you need to spend more time on this aspect so um we just ripped for 43 minutes straight I think I bro science some of that for sure um I'm all right with that but uh when I rant for 43 minutes, I have no idea what's coming out of my mouth. I hope it makes sense. Um, again, I don't look at any of these questions beforehand. I answer some of them on Instagram beforehand, but I don't review this, any of the questions or anything like that. So I see the question, I answer the question. If you have any more in depth, if you want me to elaborate on anything or explain something or I said something stupid, just ask in the questions, I'll explain it. But uh, I appreciate you making it this far, if you made it this far. And uh, we will get to next week's Q&A and rip from there. Keep chopping wood, let's go.